Can we all take our seats, please? Uh, welcome. Welcome, everyone. My name is Jos Powellein. I'm a professor of international law here at the Graduate Institute and also at Georgetown Law. Um, standing next to Ms. Chris Brummer, the co-organizer of this uh, conference. And, and some of you may ask, what, what are they thinking of when we refer to G2? G2 stands for Graduate Institute, G, uh, and Georgetown. And, and really, over the years, we've been doing many things together. Uh, some of you were there already yesterday, this morning, thinking of the trade lab, the clinics, the practicum, uh, the Journal of International Economic Law, and this big uh, G2 conference. So all of you, welcome. We have many people registered. So looking forward to a, to a fantastic conference debate. And, and I don't know how you feel about trade these days, but I fluctuate between getting up in the morning all excited about the possibilities, starting from a clean sheet, all the new things that may be possible. But the next day I wake up and I'm, I feel completely depressed. <laughs> and, and I think about what a fool have I been working on this for the last 20 years, taking it for granted, um, spending perhaps too much time on the detail, not the bigger picture. But I think that's a bit the, the state we are in. Uh, anxiousness about what is happening, uh, on many different fronts, but also excitement as to what is new out there. And, and how can we, after 20 years of not much happening in a way, how could we rethink some of the uh, systemic features? So let me be brief on, on what we're trying to do here. In this conference, you'll see we, we are reorganizing it a little bit. We start with a, with a lunch, and then we'll have a keynote and three panels, so a heavy afternoon. And tomorrow we'll move to the WTO headquarters, where we'll have two more panels. Um, and all of you registered for the conference should be able to walk into the WTO um, at that time. But the, the more, the broader goals of doing this, because trust me, doing this <laughs> takes a lot of energy. And, and of course, we are working on public funds, so we have to spend it well and think about, okay, what do we want to achieve? I think the first goal, and especially this year, we've made an effort getting there, is to bring a little bit of a US voice to Geneva. Uh, this is Georgetown. It's very hard in Geneva to kind of figure out what's happening in Washington. We don't have official USTR representatives, but we have many people from a diversity of backgrounds coming from the US, uh, all of whom are in one way or the other linked to Georgetown. So this is really a plus, and I hope we can use that US presence to, to engage in a, in a productive debate. The, the second goal, and that you'll see from the program, is, is to combine two things, very different things. One is up-to-date events, and, and as you know, it changes every day, right? The, the latest thing is what the potential tariffs on Mexico for uh, immigration purposes, but who knows what happens in between now and, and tomorrow. So to really stay up to date, talk about recent events, um, hear from practitioners uh, today and tomorrow. We'll hear from many different diplomats, ambassadors, from law firm people helping out clients in the trenches, but to then try and go beyond this, to really combine that day-to-day -day work, practical insight, with academic rigor. We have a lot of academics as well who will um, present their views, for example, tomorrow we'll have a whole uh, panel on the trade wars because we have with the Journal of International Economic Law a special issue on trade wars and the plan is to present the draft papers for that special issue and to get input uh, from, from all of you. So to combine practice with longer term visionary thinking about where the system is heading. Which brings me to, to my last point, thinking of goals. Uh, the last point is, and. I don't know, we sneaked in a slightly different title this year. It used to be called the WTO Conference. Um, not that we are giving up on the WTO yet, but I think it is clear from the panels also that we will look into that, that we need to think beyond. Um, be supportive of the WTO, but also realize there's a lot of other things happening. So the title of the conference is G2 Annual Conference on WTO and Global Economic Regulation. And you'll see, uh, especially this afternoon, we'll talk a lot about unilateral uh, actions, be it out of the US, but also out of the EU. The EU regulating and having an effect on, on the rest of the world. So 
That goal is to, to you know, both to practitioners but also to the many students here, um, to make it clear that today it's more than just a WTO. And we'll have speakers on finance, on uh, investment screening and, and other issues uh, like this. So with this, I'd like to welcome you again. One small housekeeping uh, matter. Uh, this event is being live streamed. Uh, as you know, it's not, not for everyone to, to buy a ticket into Geneva and we really wanted to, to make the debates more widely available. So it's live streamed and it will be available on YouTube afterwards. I leave it to you to adjust what you want to say or not to say, but it is completely, completely open. Chris. So w w with that, and all my remarks will be very brief. Um, uh, I was going to come here with the bag as a prop to say, well, I guess I'll say something since our, our name is on the tote bag. Um, but really, thank you so much for, for being here. Just to add to one little note about the change in the title. I think that what we've all seen over the last couple of years is uh, not just increasing frictions in international economic diplomacy, but really uh, growth in what international economic law means in, 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 from a lawyerly perspective. The fact that there's inherent interdisciplinarity within that conversation, that decisions made in international monetary policy can have implications for international trade policy, which can in turn have implications for international financial regulation, and as a result, the kinds of conversations that are coming uh, about uh, and by academics have to be informed by uh, a wider variety of perspectives, just as at the very time in which we're trying to create uh, better and more robust and responsive uh, institutional structures. So hopefully we can continue that conversation as, as, as well over the next two days. Uh, the Institute of International Economic Law, it's always a pleasure to coordinate uh, and, uh, our activities and events and our personnel and our students uh, with the Graduate Institute uh, and welcome. Wonderful. Thank you, Chris. All right. So uh, I wanted to also highlight that at the end of the, the last page of the program, you'll see that it's not just Chris and myself who've been putting this together. There's a, a big academic committee with uh, Jan Bohanus, Jennifer Hillman, Gabriel Marceau, Xin Yipeng, Peter van den Bosse, Marcus Wagner, and uh, the team here at the Graduate Institute, Teresa Carpenter, Lorenzo Sarmiento, uh, Christine Washington back in Georgetown, and Angelica Zan Zaninelli um, here at the Graduate Institute. Plus, very importantly, uh, our sponsors, which um, we have every year, and it's really fantastic that you keep supporting us. Um, on that note of um, thinking beyond uh, law, beyond the WTO, we, we'll kick off with a keynote address and I'm really excited, and it, it does highlight what you were saying. Um, I'm really excited to, to, to introduce my, my colleague, Richard Baldwin, who is um, with me. We are together co-directing the Center for Trade and Economic Integration, and it's been a pleasure for the last 10 years to, to do that with him, to try and see these synergies between law and economics. And um, we were thinking of, okay, whom can we invite a big name and as always, you start looking outside, but then we realize actually in-house we have an amazing scholar who is becoming a little bit of a you know, global star with his two uh, recent books. Um, Richard, of course, is, is an economist, a very famous trade economist with a lot of expertise also on regional integration at the EU level. But the thing I admire him the most for is the fact that he's not only a um, highly skilled, obviously, uh, economist at the technical level, but he's been one of the few economists who are able to, to also zoom out and to really uh, put different economic studies and other studies together and, and write essentially a popular book. And for that, I, I really admire him, um, and it's been a, a true pleasure to, to work with him. By the way, he's one of many, or well, few economists on my side that you can actually talk to as a lawyer. That's another challenge often. That, that, that we lawyers face. And I'm sure it's the economist's fault, not the lawyer's fault. Uh, no, it, it goes both ways. So Richard has a PhD at uh, MIT, where he worked with Paul Krugman and has been with us at the Graduate Institute um, for a while. But he has recently published two uh, best-selling books. Um, and, and I think that's more or less also what you, you will talk about. So Richard, uh, thank you so much for doing this. I'm, I'm turning the floor to you. and and. Richard has agreed for a Q&A at the end, uh, so I'll come back to, to moderate that. Thank you so much, Richard. Very good. 
Can we get the slides up? Here we go. Okay. So um, thank you, Jos, for those very kind words of introduction. Uh, I'll have you know that my mother is a lawyer and worked for the Wisconsin State Legislature. Uh, so she was something of a public lawyer. Um, so maybe that's why I can talk to lawyers. I don't know. Um, it's a privilege and a pleasure to share my ideas with um, this audience. I, I do think that more economists ought to talk with more lawyers. Actually, trade economics and trade law is not one of the most difficult to speak together, as long as you're the type of trade economist who actually cares anything about the real world, which is about 10% of my colleagues. Um, but I would like to apologize that most of my comments will be um, of an economic nature, uh, talking about globalization from an economic perspective. But the last couple of slides, I'm going to try and uh, spin out my thinking and my ideas for what it might mean for the future of the world trading system from a legal perspective, and that, that hopefully we can, can uh, talk about some ideas there. Okay. So, Joe, by the way, he asked me to talk about my two books. One's 300 pages long, the other one's 250 pages long. So I'm going to speak really, really fast. <laughs> and uh, skip a bunch of stuff. So first of all, what I'd like to start out with is that globalization changed around 1990, but economic thinking about globalization didn't. And that's really what my first book is about, my 2016 book is explaining that. So when I mean globalization change, so the chart on the left, that's G7 exports. I turned the red to blue just around 1980, and you can see the G7 share of global exports plummeted from about 1990. The middle one is the G7 share of world GDP, and again, I changed it from red to blue around 19, that's in 1988, and you can see it's plummeted from about two-thirds down to one-half in two decades. And if you look at the share of G7 manufacturing, of, of global manufacturing, it also declined fairly gently between 70 and 1990, but much more steeply after 1990. And again, it went from about two-thirds to under on one-half. Now, I would invite you to observe that a single model of globalization in which the main thing is the cost of moving goods falls can't explain this unless you have some extremely complicated things. And what I'd like to present in the next five or 10 minutes is a broader view of globalization in which these sorts of changes are natural and inevitable. And I'm going to try and spin out a little bit what it means. But above all, I'd like you to stop thinking about globalization as mostly about goods crossing borders, and certainly not exclusively as goods crossing borders. Now, I know many of you will be regulating investment flows and IP flows and service flows, so of course, law obviously recognizes that many other things cross borders. But when you read the newspapers and when you hear speeches, governments, practical people, many business people, stylize the world in a world where trades crossing, goods crossing borders is, is what globalization is. Now, trade policy also changed more or less at this same time basically because governments understood that trade policy didn't work the way it did before. Uh, from about 1990, developing countries started slashing their tariffs and they went from double digits, almost all of them down to 9% or more uh, in, a, in an amazing cascade. The middle graph shows the number of bilateral investment treaties signed per year and the little bars show that from 1988 they were a relatively rare bird to signing a couple hundred a year until we started running out of bilateral to sign. So, so many have been signed. And then they started coming off. And the last one is the number of deep agreements, deep provisions in RTAs. And by deep, I mean it's provisions that govern things beyond tariffs, beyond like Article 24 things. And uh, I'm going to argue that something fundamentally changed in the world of globalization that it was driven by a technological shock, and it explains all these things and all these governments' reactions. Okay, so I'm not going to have a complicated theory. I'm going to simplify to clarify, which I hope uh, will intrigue you to think harder and maybe even read the book where I'm a little less simple, but this is going to be uh, pretty simple. Okay, 
I'd like you to think about globalization as arbitrage. Does this work? On this part? Here we go. Suzanne? Okay. And what I mean by arbitrage, now in different audiences, arbitrage means different things, but to explain what I mean here, let me talk about something other than globalization just for a moment. When people go to Germany, they try the beer because the beer is rather good. And when people go to France, they try the wine because the wine is rather good. Now, globalization is driven by companies that exploit these differences. They make the stuff in countries that are rather good at it, and they sell it elsewhere. Now, up till now, most of this arbitrage has been in goods because it's very easy to move goods across borders. You make it here and ship it there. And for two centuries, that's been actually relatively easy to do and relatively low cost. Other stuff is systematically harder to move across borders. In particular, services, things that we do, are harder to ship across borders. So until fairly recently, this arbitrage was primarily in goods for technological reasons. Now, what I would like you to do is in think about globalization of arbitrage as happening in these three things. Now, of course, there's so many sharp Libgo minds here. I'm sure you can think of other things that we will arbitrage. But let me stick with these three big things. Goods, know-how, and labor services. Things that have very different prices across the world and which there is an incentive to make it here and sell it there if you could. Now, this, globe, this arbitrage is constrained by three costs. Trade costs constrain arbitrage in goods, communication costs, which constrains arbitrage in know-how, and face-to-face -face costs, which constrains arbitration in labor services. And what I'd like to invite you to think of globalization, past, present, and future, as associated in the past with trade in goods. The present with communication costs being down and trade and know-how, and face-to-face, -face, in other words, labor services, as the future. And now I'm going to go through this framework, rather than trying to explain it logically or with charts or anything. I'm going to try and organize a couple hundred years of history using this framework, trying to convince you that it's a useful way to structure your understanding of what happened, and in particular, what changed around 1990. And then, and I'm, after I'm done with that, that should take about 12, 15 minutes, I'm going to use that same framework to think about what it means for future globalization. Should we ready? 12 minutes, 200 years? <laughs> I may skip a few details, so if your favorite historical event is not in here, sorry about that in advance. Okay, goods arbitrage begins, cost of moving goods falls radically, cost of moving ideas and people falls much less. So economic historians tell us that modern globalization really got going in about 1820, uh, not coincidentally with the rise of steam power. Now that lowered the cost of moving goods, and of course it moved the other, lowered the other ones as well, but nowhere near as dramatically. So just to be simple, to clarify, let's say the cost of moving goods went way down and the others didn't change. Low trade costs makes high volume trade feasible. National comparative advantage makes it profitable. So before the steam revolution, production and consumption were bundled geographically at a very tight level, basically the village level, because people were tied to the land. That's what almost everybody did, grow their own food. And if they needed any goods, they were made very close by, basically within walking distance, because it was so expensive and dangerous to move goods over anything but the smallest distance. So production and consumption were geographically bundled by the high cost of moving goods. When the cost of moving goods came down, it was possible to separate the production of goods from the consumption of goods, and when you do that, you get international trade. Trade costs came down, trade flows boomed, Countries specialize in producing what they do relatively well and consume from all over the world. 
That is the standard narrative of globalization. And when you still read about globalization today in the newspapers and in many articles, they're still talking about how lowering trade costs is leading to quicker movement of, of goods. Or more particularly, fairly recently, as the growth of goods trade has slowed down, they talk about globalization being reversed. Because in their minds, trading goods is what globalization is all about. Now, the trade wasn't the big thing. Production micro-clustered, triggering innovation and modern growth, but innovation stayed in the G7, leading to the great divergence in incomes. So what do I mean by the great divergence? We live in a world where a handful of countries are incredibly rich. Most people are pretty poor. That divergence has only been with us since about 1820. There was always some divergence, but it was nowhere near as extreme as it is now until globalization really got going. Now, what I want to do is use my framework to explain how is it that the rise of trade also led to the great divergence globally. The idea is when you have dispersed production at the village level, you sell small world, small market, small production facilities. When it opens up to the big world, it becomes worthwhile adopting very scale-intensive production techniques because you're selling to the whole world. And those are typically very complex. To save on the cost of face-to-face -face and communication cost, the production were bundled tightly, basically within walking distance. And if you think about it, the Industrial Revolution actually deindustrialized most of England. It industrialized Manchester and some places around London, but the vast majority of England was deindustrialized as the little facilities went into great big facilities. And that was not to save trade costs. That was to save face-to-face -face costs to allow coordination. It had an unintended consequence. When you have dispersed production and you're only selling to 12 families saying nails, the value of innovation is very small. Moreover, since there's very few nail makers to talk to, the ideas for how to do this better are hard to find. Once the production is concentrated tightly in huge factories, the benefit of innovating goes way up. A small cost saving when you're selling to the whole world market is worth a great deal. Moreover, there's lots of people in Manchester, thinking about the same thing, so both the supply and the demand of innovation rose. And that's why growth took off in the industrialized countries at the same time as trade. And for a decade, a century and a half, the rich countries grew faster than the poor countries. That's how we got to where we are now. But the point about the second constraint on know-how is all this innovation stayed in the G7. That's why there was a divergence. Stocks of knowledge per worker built up in the G7 and could not be arbitraged away because it was so difficult to move know-how across borders and control it. Just to give you a small example, it took two centuries for the magnetic companies to get from China to European navigators. It took a thousand years for Buddhism to get to India to, to being really big in China. Ideas did move, but not very fast back then. Now, there was another shock. The information and communication technology, which appeared gradually from the 1970s, but really got going around 1990 with the internet and those sorts of things. This lowers the cost of moving ideas. So now two of the three constraints are lowered. We have easy movement of goods, easy movement of ideas, and that started changing globalization in ways that many of you will be familiar with, at least the first parts. The ICT revolution makes offshoring technically feasible. Vast wage differences make it profitable. So this microcluster factory, let's say it's a Toyota factory in Nagoya, is doing everything in Nagoya even though it would have been cheaper to do certain stages, let's say sew the leather seats onto the, uh, the seat frames, that would have been cheaper to do it somewhere else. But before the ICT revolution, 
we coordinated stuff by fax, by airmail letters, and occasionally by landline calls. Now, how many of you remember organizing conferences by fax, an airmail letter? That was difficult. And in that kind of world, there is absolutely no way Bombardier could make the tails of its business jet in central Mexico and hope that they would fit into the rest of it up in Quebec, coordinating by airmail letter. What changed was it became technically feasible to organize complex activities over long distances and keep them coordinated. That's what led to the boom in FDI, in outsourcing, in uh, the movement of jobs overseas. So this is ICT coordinated this factory unbundling. That's the second unbundling, the factory's unbundling. And it's the ICT that coordinates it. Some aspects of that we can measure. Foreign direct investment, number of jobs, foreign affiliates, foreign affiliate sales. There's a whole bunch of stuff we can measure, but that misses the big point. The big thing that changed was that knowledge arbitrage began. G7 firms offshored their know-how with jobs in factories, and that started the great convergence when the G7 share of world income started plummeting, and especially India and China started going up. Now, the way that it goes is before the second unbundling, before the offshoring, knowledge stayed at home. And therefore, the rich countries were growing faster than the poor countries. When the unbundling happens, you don't see Bombardier making business jet tails in Mexico with Mexican technology. They took their technology and combined it with foreign workers in nearby developing countries, thereby denationalizing comparative advantage. It wasn't national factories in Mexico competing with national factors in Canada. It was G7 firms taking Canadian know-how and combining it with Mexican workers, which allowed Mexican workers to do things that they could never have done with their own technology. Now, as you know, knowledge is the basis of modern growth. So what we saw was a fantastically fast industrialization of a handful of developing nations involved in global value chains. And that industrialization was not like the last one. It was, to a large extent, primed by the movement of firm-specific knowledge from G7 countries to nearby developing countries. So the miracle was that the light bulbs started crossing borders. Not the jobs, not the FDI, not the capital. The key was that know-how was now crossing borders. And I don't just mean IP. I mean, how do you arrange a factory floor so you're efficient? Lots of stuff. Lots of stuff that, that uh, never crossed borders before. Now, in some ways, this new globalization, or the second unbundling, as I sometimes call it, was a new pipeline for knowledge arbitrage. So this is another sort of infographic to make the same point, and, and it's the key point, so I want to stress it one more time. Let's think of the world, to simplify, to clarify, as two groups of countries. Headquarter economies, which are G7, and factory economies, which are developing countries. Now, in headquarter economies, they have high know-how to labor ratios, which supports high wages. The developing countries have low know-how to labor ratios, which leads to low wages. And before, that's how it stayed. With ICT, you could open up a pipeline between that knowledge and the low wages, and the knowledge started flowing to the low wages especially in manufactured goods, and relatively rapidly, which led to the deindustrialization of the G7. It led to the falling trade share of the G7. It led to the rise of GVCs, which led to great big trade flows with developing countries. It's why developing countries lowered their tariffs, because in this world, tariffs hinder your competitiveness, not helping it, especially in intermediate goods. And that's what we saw. Many final goods, the tariffs stayed high. Intermediate goods, they all came down. It's why countries signed bilateral investment treaties, because they wanted those factories. Both the people who wanted the factory and the people who wanted to sell the factory wanted a legal underpinning for it. So countries who for years, decades, viewed FDI as selling the family silver started signing bilateral investment treaties that gave away significant parts of their sovereignty. And they started signing deep regional trade agreements 
because these relationships aren't multilateral. If you want American factories, you sign a regional agreement with the United States. If you want one with Europe, you go to Brussels. If you want one with Japan, you go to Tokyo. So these bilateral trade agreements started putting in a whole bunch of legal underpinnings to, allow, to make the flows of goods, services, information, people, all those easier. That's why globalization changed in 1990. How long did that take? Well, a little longer than I thought. But anyways, um, that's the basic idea of the first unbundling, the second unbundling. And I think that's where we are now. Although that whole story, the low-hanging fruit has all been picked. All the easy stuff in GVCs is gone, and there's some, uh, as, as Joseph was saying, there's some indications that that may be going into reverse or at least regionalizing. Okay. But the result of this is that the new globalization in, in, impact is more sudden, more individual, more unpredictable, and more uncontrollable. And it's created a sense in the rich countries that no matter what your job or skill you have, you can't really be sure your job won't be next. And I think that uncertainty, that fragility, is part of the backlash that you see, especially in the working class, in the rich countries. Now, it's more sudden because it's driven by ICT, not tariff cuts or building ports or railroads. So it can happen very fast. In two decades, you can get changes that would normally have taken five decades before. It's more individual because we're no longer talking about competitiveness at a level of industries or sectors. It's individual stages. One little bit of making air conditioners went from Indiana to Mexico, and the people in that factory who were involved in that bit of the production lost their jobs. The other people became more competitive because that bit of the production got cheaper. So it's no longer sector by sector, skill group by skill group. It's fragmented. It's more unpredictable because we don't really understand how these things and why these things got put together. Therefore, we don't really understand where it's going. And companies are, there are people who pay, who companies pay other companies to consult on what they should and shouldn't offshore. And some of it were getting reshored, et cetera. And it's more uncontrollable because what's key here is the knowledge crossing borders as Donald Trump has found out with his tariffs on intermediate goods. You can put tariffs on intermediate goods, but Harley Davidson is perfectly able to move the production of exports to Malaysia and the production of American sold bikes to America. And that know-how, which is what triggered the original deindustrialization, can't be controlled by things like tariffs and quotas. Okay, now on to my, 19, uh, my 2019 book, uh, The Globotics Upheaval. So this is about both automation and it's really about the future of work, but I'm gonna focus on the aspects which are the future of globalization here. But let me first explain a little bit the title, because uh, most people, it's, it's pronounced Globotics. Can we try that? Globotics. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm hoping you all remember. Globotics is an ugly but hopefully memorable word that smashes together globalization and robotics to make a very simple point, and this is the point. Digital technology is the new big breakthrough, and every day you read about how it's affecting robots and automation. But you're forgetting, or some of, us, some of us are forgetting, that it's changing globalization at the same speed and affecting the same jobs. In other words, service jobs and professional jobs. That's this, this little sign there with the exclamation point. That's to emphasize why I put the second word in the title, upheaval. Because I think it's possible that white collar workers who are displaced by white collar robots and globalization will join hands with the blue collar workers who've been disrupted in the last two decades and we may get a big disruption, a big backlash. Sometimes they call it the tech lash. And if you want to see an example of this, look up the presidential candidate called Andrew Yang. His hashtag is Yang Gang. Um, he has videos which is basically the globotics transformation. Outsour outsourcing of service jobs, automation of service jobs, he believes will cause a revolution in the US and he wants to do something about it. He won't win. He doesn't have anywhere near hundreds of millions of dollars. He's several hundred million dollars short of what it takes to win a presidential campaign in the United States. But his ideas, I will bet you dollars to donuts, will be accepted, adopted by every left-leaning candidate in the United States and probably in Europe and spreading. 
Because here's the thing. People are feeling fragile and nervous. United States unemployment rates, the lowest it's ever been, but people aren't feeling very good about it. And somebody on the right blames immigrants and China. The left will want to blame somebody, and big tech is such a convenient scapegoat. That's what I think is going to happen. I think this, the political movement in the backlash will go against tech, big tech in particular, and maybe it's already starting. Okay, future globalization, I hope you like that. Future's unknowable, but also inevitable. Do, do lawyer, is that something that bothers lawyers, or you, no? Okay. Mostly what economists do with this thing is, I don't study it, no data. <laughs> but since it's inevitable, I think that's irresponsible, because you know there's some people who are gonna be talking about it, and uh, not, not necessarily people who know what they're talking about. Okay. So just to emphasize, if you, in case you fall asleep by the end of my uh, talk, this is what I'm thinking. Globalization will be about office jobs in rich countries, not factory jobs, or not just factory jobs. And if you look through your news feeds, people are talking about robots. They're talking about physical industrial robots. Less than 9% of Americans work in factories anymore, and a lot of them are running the robots, not being replaced by robots. So you probably should just forget about steel-collared robots, industrial robots, when thinking forward. The robots that matter are white-collar software robots that replace service workers, things like RPA, robotics process automation, or virtual assistants, or chatbots, or AI platforms like Watson, things like that. That's what's going to really be moving the dial. And those people aren't ready for it. They aren't ready for automation because computers couldn't think. So any job that required some sort of thinking, you needed a real human. Now computers can think, at least in some ways, and many ways that they couldn't before. So many jobs will, that couldn't have been automated before 2016 now can. And they weren't competing on wages internationally because services were non-traded. But the reason they were non-traded was technical barriers. And digital technology is tearing down those barriers at a fantastic pace. So these people are the ones going to be the focus of future globalization in my view of the world. Okay, so this is a question. What happens when digital technology relaxes the third constraint on globalization's arbitrage? Think about this. Future globalization opens a pipeline for international wage competition from low-wage labor in factory economies into offices in G7 countries without leaving. I like to call it telemigration. And you know, please understand that all forms of services are going to become more traded, but this is one which I think is quite exciting and touches on workers in rich countries very directly. So people sitting in one nation working in offices in another. So this is already very common in things like web development, where an international team, virtual international team, will work on a website over two or three days uh, without ever being physically present with each other. And I, I gave a talk a couple weeks ago in London, the head of a law firm, I can't remember the name of it, but they said that they already outsourced 20% of the legal services to places, uh, he called them high-skill, low-wage countries, and uh, working together in teams. So anyways, I just think this is going to go a lot faster. Okay, so what I want to do is argue why and how this is going to happen. So first of all, the wage gap makes it profitable. And that's just my point that globalization is arbitrage. Some of the largest price differences in the world today are for high-end service sector workers, like me, like some of you. My salary is about 20 times what it is for a professor teaching the same stuff in Manila. And he may even also have a PhD from MIT. Now, if the Graduate Institute could arbitrage that 20 to 1 difference, they would. But it's difficult to do technologically, but those technological barriers are coming fast. So that's the second part. It's digital tech which is going to make it possible. This vast arbitrage possibility is what's going to drive it. So let me just talk about four ways, and this could work. Digitech enables telemigration. So the first one, domestic remote work paves the way. So how many of you uh, telecommute to work? Say, half day a week, day a week, hands up. Okay, 
Not so many. Your jobs are going first, by the way. <laughs> the point is, is that commuting, domestic telecommuting is really popular in the United States, increasingly popular in Europe, not so much in Japan, but it's getting there. Our companies and our organizations are changing the nature of work. They're going to project-based. They're going to matrix structure. They're going to agile structure. And they're adopting collaborative software based in the cloud to make it easy to slot remote workers into teams and keep it all going. They're investing in hardware like really good screens or telepresence rooms or telepresence robots, which makes it the remote workers feel less remote. Now, once they've arranged that work, they will soon figure out that they could get at least some of those tasks done for one-tenth the price of you, and parts of your job will start to be replaced by telemigrants. Now, having a remote worker in, say, the Philippines doing something in Tokyo isn't quite as good as having a local in place but it's a whole lot cheaper. So what do you think is going to happen? That's the way to think about telemigration. It's just domestic telecommuting with a big wage gap driving it. The second thing is online matchmaking platforms, the biggest of which is called Upwork. And if you have never heard of Upwork, or if you've never seen Upwork, or the ones like it, you really have to look it up. These are like the container ships of future globalization. They're like eBay, but for services. So eBay was amazing because if you had something to sell and somebody wanted to buy it, eBay let you find them, underpin the financial transaction, and provided a certain quality assurance in it. Upwork does that for freelancers, service freelancers, all around the world. There's millions of freelancers registered in over 100 countries. And there's a platform competition going on. There's a Chinese one called Whitmart. There's a number of American ones, Fiverr, Freelancer. There's a whole bunch of these things, and sometimes they're specialized. But basically, it's making easy, easier for your companies to find replacements for some of the things you're doing. The third is advanced telecoms. And all of you will have recognized, I guess many of you work in law firms that probably have telepresence rooms because it's so important face-to-face -face in many of the things you do, delicate discussions. How many of you use telepresence rooms? OK, there we go. As you can see the private sector there. Um, <laughs> but even Skype is getting way better. Uh, FaceTime is really pretty good. Uh, and very soon, with 5G, we'll have, and, and 5G is coming, we'll have augmented reality, which is where you wear glasses and they project things like other people at the, at the conference table while you're sitting there. So it seems like they're right there. And beyond that, there's virtual reality and all sorts of other things like that. Basically, it means that remote people will be less remote. And that remoteness is what stopped services from being traded, or lots of it. As that te technology comes along, it'll go. The, the fourth one is machine translation. So language has been an enormous barrier to trade and services, which is why countries like India and Philippines, and Kenya have had such a good edge. But machine translation since 2016 is getting incredibly good and it's getting uh, twice as good every couple years. So it's really, it's, go it's gone from, well, it depends which language you're using. But in any case, in the main languages, especially with English, used to be a party trick. You know, you, if you were bilingual, it would be funny. But if you haven't tried it in the last six months, you really have to. And the key was the UN put on millions of hand translated sentences, all the dialogues in the six major languages back to, I think, the 1950s or so. So they had a huge data set. And then the US, the Canada, Canadian Parliament put all the English, French, and then the EU Parliament put them up, and the Commission put theirs up, all the hand-translated sentences. So they've started estimating models that translate sentence by sentence, not word by word, and that changed it enormously, especially if you talk like a UN diplomat. It's not so good with rap songs. But in any case, that will tear down barriers. And just to give you an example, standard estimates of the trade boosting effect of a common language are 100%. That's a common one. And some of them are larger. So even if you only make it half as big, you're going to get big flows of trade and big flows of services. 
In fact, there's a, an MIT professor, Bryn Jolfesen, who's using the Upwork data, and he shows uh, this, there's been a quite discrete change in machine translation by language pair. And they show that, that where the language crossed a particular threshold for how good it is, it increased services trade by 17% in one year. So it's, it's big, these are really big numbers and it's pretty much underappreciated. So to summarize, if you could think about what happened in the 1990s was a tsunami of manual workers joining the manufacturing sector globally. Hundreds of millions of people who used to be excluded from the global job markets in manual work joined because of container ships and reforms and, uh, and also a big thing is the know-how that came with the unbundling. That changed a lot of things in our countries, in the rich countries, and it changed a lot of things in a handful of developing countries who were on the right side of the global value chain revolution. I think the 2020s will be a tsunami of talent in services. I think hundreds of millions of talented, low-cost professionals who are extremely good but excluded from the job market by technical reasons will start to join the service market. And as the change in supply of manual workers disrupted the rich country's blue collar community, this is gonna disrupt the white collar community. So, a cheerful thought, let's move on. <laughs> and if you wanna know what to do about it, you can read the book. <laughs> um, I can say that, can't I, Joseph? Yeah, it's live screamed, right? <laughs> Did I mention the title? <laughs> no, okay. So. Let's go on to some stuff that's a lot more speculative, but might have something to do with what you're really interested in, which is questions for the trade system. And um, understanding how little I know about trade, uh, although I feel confident talking about trade law in, among economists, I don't feel comfortable talking about trade law in this audience, so I've turned this into a series of questions for you uh, to make you think hard about some things. Okay, the first one is, Services traded, manufacturers not, question mark. Now, how does this work? Digitech is making robots much better. That's automating the manufacturing production process in almost every industry. That's lowering the labor cost share and therefore removing the incentive to make stuff one place and sell it another place. Because if the factors of production are traded, there is no competitive advantage. Every country has the same cost. So the main reason people make stuff in China and manufactured goods, I mean, it's complicated now, but in the beginning, it was because they had low wages. But if you were in an industry in which the wages were only 1 or 2% of the whole thing, let's say semiconductor fabrication, you didn't bother doing it in China. And robots are making the entire industry have lower labor cost shares, and therefore, manufactured goods are systematically becoming less and less traded. But at the same time, Digitech is making remote workers become less remote. Uh, and that's going to lead to massive trade and services, especially south to north. So remember, services are where the south has the comparative advantage for most things. And the only reason we haven't seen it is because they were typically non-traded. So what does that mean for the trading system? Let me ask four questions. What about service dumping? Don't you think somebody pretty soon is gonna be talking about dumping services? Anybody wanna start up a law practice? <laughs> but how would you calculate the margins? It, it, if, if you want some analogies, the taxation, the value-added taxation of services is much harder than it is on goods, but different countries have solved that problem in different ways, through zero rating or excluding it altogether. But in any case, the basic idea of keeping track of where value is added and how much is what is why it's hard to put value-added taxes on them, but it'll also be why it's hard to calculate dumping margins. But if you believe the upheaval bit of what I was just saying, there will be a big push to avoid dumping in whatever it is. Second, revisit the mode one commitments. One of the great ironies of this world was uh, we actually don't need any more law or agreements to make this stuff happen. 
1994, we got the GATS. And at that time, the, GAT, the WTO, or it was actually the GATT at the time, was run by the Quad. And the Quad had only offensive interests in mode one trade. Rich countries were exporting mode one to poor countries. And in a great act of kindness, they all put almost all their sectors into no restrictions on mode one. So in essence, there's free trade from the rich country's perspective. Now that they are going to be on the rece receiving ends of a great deal of importation of this stuff, I think we may see them revisit their mode one uh, commitments, at least on, in the rich country side. Labor standards. So labor standards is a big thing in goods. Uh, political thing um, for, for labor unions. It's also become a political thing for consumers who really care about who made their goods. And we have systems, imperfect though they are, of checking that labor standards are enforced in the factories that make the stuff we buy. We know how to do that. We send somebody to the factory. But when it comes to services, it's much more difficult to know who actually is providing the service. And my, I will project, I will uh, guess that we'll have some scandals like the Nike scandals, uh, but for photo tagging. My guess is that companies like, say, Walmart, what they'll do is they'll take uh, 100,000 photos, and then they have somebody on the internet tag those phones. You, you need a human to tag it the first time before you train your model. And who knows, we'll probably find out that it's 12-year-old girls chained to chairs in outer Mongolia in freezing conditions, doing the tagging, getting paid three cents an hour. Big scandal. The point is, is how would you know it wasn't them? So I'm pretty sure we're going to have to find out ways of imposing, you know, not ex just the basic labor standards, like no child labor, in this service sector trade. And the fourth one is income taxation. So uh, people who do this on, on, on platforms like Upwork and, and even, even outside of those, if they, if they found, each other, found people directly, the question is where do they pay taxes? Now, uh, it's very unlikely that they're paying taxes in the country where they're actually working, uh, which will strike the other workers as incredibly unfair to start with. But it's also quite likely that they're not paying taxes in their own country because they're not filing, they're not being paid through the financial system in the usual way. They have not an employment contract. So I talked to the CEO of, of Upwork at Davos this year, um, Kessrel, and he said in the United States, they omit 1099s for all US freelancers to alert the government or potentially alert the government for taxation. And he said, and I said, well, what about Sri Lanka? And he says, well, they don't ask. But he would if he'd asked. So I think we need some sort of agreement or law or cooperation or best practice so that the platforms at least inform the local government of the revenue, uh, probably make it more self-sustaining. OK, the last one, and I'll promise to do this very quickly. What is data, question mark? So I was uh, reviewing uh, stuff for the T20 in uh, Osaka recently, and there was a an economist who wrote a paper which said, data is just like goods, therefore it should be free. Well, it won't surprise you that it was a Japanese economist who wrote that. But then it made me think, what is data? We know how to regulate goods, services, IP, investment, financial capital, and migration. We have whole regimes for that, legal regimes, and also economic regimes, taxation regimes. Which of these is data? Or do we have to invent an entirely new regulatory regime? Now, in my reflection, and I don't, haven't finished this reflection, I think some types of data correspond to each of those five. But there is no such thing as data when it comes to international regulation. And we need to get some more nuance on that data. So in preparing these slides, spending five minutes thinking about it, but actually sometimes five minutes is the best five minutes. Then you spend another five months working it out. Here's my thoughts. Uh, we need more nuance on data. We need modes, like we have modes on trade. And we, what are the features that would distinguish these modes? So here, thoughts on key data feature. Durability, sensitivity, exclusivity. So some data, let's say Snap, uh, Instagram photos, disappear very quickly. So even if the privacy all goes wrong, it's not that big of a deal. 
and I suspect that technologically we may have seen more and more disappearing data, but also some data just is only relevant for short periods of time. Like if you're near a coffee shop, that's important data to the coffee shop while you're there. After that, it's not all that important. Sensitivity, medical records, your, your DNA is totally different than your postal address for delivering an eBay package. Um, financial data is sensitive in some ways, but regulators in different countries have to see that data in order to do their job. So it's sensitive, but in a different way. And some stuff is not sensitive at all. Uh, you know, it's uh, completely an, an not anonymous. Uh, it can't track people. It can't really be used uh, in, in, uh, in ways that are harmful. So it's not sensitive. And exclusivity. Lots of information is free, available on the web to anybody like my birth date, you can find. So why should that be super sensitive if it's not exclusive? And the last thing I would throw in is, does it have a public good element? And the aspect, the, the classic one is uh, personal medical data in um, a medical emergency. So let, let's say there's an outbreak of some ter terrible disease in some place. And for public interest reasons, you have to transmit that data to the doctors, maybe in different countries, maybe going through different companies, but there's this big public need for that data right now. And you wouldn't want the trade regulation to prevent them from stopping uh, plagues in Africa, for example. So I'll stop right there and uh, suggest some modes. Mode one, not durable, not sensitive, or, and or not exclusive. Mode two, exclusive and sensitive, but not durable. Mode three, all three, exclusive, sensitive, and durable. So thanks for listening to some blue sky conjectures. I'll stop there. Richard, this was absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for doing this. My pleasure. I've heard you explain it a couple of times, but each time I, I, <laughs> I learn something new. Um, we have a few moments left for, for Q&A, because I think the, the, the main thing, and you, you managed to do it brilliantly, is to think about, okay, what do these historical evolutions of globalization, what do they mean for us lawyers or people, the diplomats in the room, uh, thinking about regulation? Um, regulation that could stimulate the arbitrage, could, could limit it. As you said, tariffs is the big debate these days, because, but perhaps it's completely beside the point mm -hmm. as to, to what is really happening. So to, to make that link between your books and, and the, the topic of, of, of this conference. So I'll take a few questions, um, if, I, if I may, and we have microphones. Perhaps we can collect a couple and then let, get back to, uh, to Richard. Okay. If you can raise your hands so I can direct uh, Okay, so one, two, three. If you can, yes, we can start in the back there. Thank you. Thank and if you. you can briefly just say who you are and your affiliation, thank you. Okay, thank you. My name is Daniel. I'm working at the OECD and I'm doing a master's in Skanspo and Georgetown. Um, I had a question regarding the telemigration and I was thinking about the possibility of which possibilities this might m imply for middle-income countries. So middle-income countries have been stuck in a trap where they can no longer compete with the new industrializing countries because they have already wages that are a little bit larger than in those countries. But this new trend might be an opportunity for them to jump back into the competition and actually being able to catch up with more developed countries. Okay, and the second question, who, uh, was it? Yeah, yes, please. You can bring a microphone just over there, please. So my name is Lakshmi Gopal. I'm from the University of Halle Wittenberg, but I speak more as a double-barreled Indian American. So I really appreciated your uh, point in trying to think about data in a more nuanced way. Um, my question is about uh, the framework through which we approach that question, um, a lot of the discussion that we saw in the history of globalization was from a first world perspective. So I, 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 you know, I, I've noticed that Bombay has changed more in the past five years than Washington DC has in the past three decades. So how will innovation changes in developing countries and um, 
uh, technologies uh, that are sort of changing all the relationships geographically and temporally, how will these impact the way that we think about the different modes of data? Wonderful. And then over here, Chris had a question. Uh, I just had a question in terms of uh, the larger question of GDP. If you're outsourcing the lower uh, wage jobs, you're still maintaining very often, very frequently, the um, higher wage jobs. And what you could in turn see, and this is what you're seeing in law firms and even in the academy in, 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 in some ways, is that you get larger uh, differences in terms of the income distribution within countries if the gains from those supply chains, whether or not they be knowledge-based or data-based or whatever it is, if the gains from those uh, changes in the supply chain, uh, chains are still upstreamed uh, to those higher waging jobs, does that uh, mean a stabilization in terms of relative GDP at a country level? Because ultimately, the gains could still be flowing to that higher income uh, population. Okay, wonderful. So prepare for you the next round of questions. Inequality. Uh, perhaps in a moment. I'll first turn to Richard, but if you have more questions, be ready to ask them. Richard. Right, so the OECD question. Um, I think uh, I, I, the book I wrote in published uh, February uh, this year uh, is all about rich countries, because that's where I'm uh, most afraid that people aren't ready for it and, and, and hiding. But I'm writing a paper in September uh, for WIDER uh, on what the, what the globotics transformation means for developing countries. And one of the main takeaways is it's good for middle-income people in middle, uh, middle-class people in middle-income countries. Uh, that people who have skills that are recognizable at the international level could be bookkeeping. It could be knowing how to check somebody into a hotel. But it can't be picking coffee beans. Um, and you have to have a connectivity, so you're pretty much talking about middle-income countries. You have to have some way of paying them, so that leaves out all the poorest countries in the world where you can't send money into, the, into their banking system. So I, I think you're exactly right. In particular, I think the mar emerging market miracle will spread and be driven by service-led export growth. So I think that there will have a lot more emerging market miracles, and they'll look a lot more like India than they did like China. Part because the automate, first of all, fabrication of manufactured goods has become commodified. It's not really that great. But if you're poor enough, it's still a great job. But it's getting worse and worse. And, it's, and there's fewer and fewer of them because of automations. Whereas services is opening up. And uh, there's lots, lots of export boom. So I think it will spread geographically. I think there'll be an incentive to use African countries for telemigrating to Europe, South American countries to North America, Southeast Asia to Northeast Asia. So I think the emerging market miracle will spread, but leave the lowest income countries behind. Um, in, in, uh, if the question from uh, India, US. Um, the, uh, the, the spread, I think, will continue, as, as I said. Uh, how it works for countries like India, I'm not sure. It's, it's an interesting thing. Let me just talk somewhat tangentially what your question was, and then come to the data. So India is, was obviously one on the first round of this, which is called business process outsourcing, which was not really telemigration. It was people having work, sending it, get it done, and sent it back. Um, but those, many of those jobs are being replaced by robotic process automation software. And interestingly enough, it's the Indian multinationals like Infosys who are at the forefront, or some of the at the forefront of BPA of RPA. So they've understood, and they're leapfrogging themselves, putting workers out of work in Bangalore but, and replacing it through RPA done in, say, the United States. So it's a kind of an interesting thing. Now, the role of data there, um, again, I haven't completed my reflections on data, so I'm a little bit hesitant. And I actually, um, I mean, I, I generally speaking, in, in favor of free trade of stuff, but the Indian ambassador, he'll, he'll be here tomorrow, uh, he says, you know, we don't understand enough about data to set to lock in place regulations. And I, I have some sympathy for that. Although I think, it, you know, many kinds of data were for centuries considered okay, like your postal address to deliver a package. That was, that, you know, it's for centuries it's been okay to move that across countries, across companies. So why not uh, at least move on the easy stuff? 
the data, I don't know if you're talking about the data is the new oil stuff and we give our data for free, but it comes back after we pay for it, stuff like that. I think that's also tied up with the uh, uh, over concentration of the digital sector in a handful of American and Chinese firms. And that is, I think, uh, a big problem for countries who don't have those firms. But I'm not sure exactly where to go with that because I'm pretty sure that if you just stop people from letting the data cross, it won't change things. Um, lastly, uh, global competition. Um, well, so let me re answer this uh, by telling a little anecdote. You know, I, I went to MIT, as you heard, and we had a big, ri in economics, we had a big rivalry between MIT and Harvard. And MIT was considered, you know, the elite, and Harvard was like second class. Um, <laughs> and so there was a joke that um, if the least mathematically capable MIT PhD student, student left MIT and went to Harvard, it would raise the average in both places. <laughs> and if you think about it, that's what globalization does. And that's why it's inequalizing. Uh, so, or another way to put it is globalization is always good for a nation's most competitive. It's always more competition for its least competitive. So uh, that, that is a big element of it in the, from the second unbundling to now. And Milano Brockovich, for instance, he has this elegant chart. And I, I believe, and in my 2016 book, I explain how this framework can explain how it is that the working class in, in, the, in the rich countries really got it in the neck, the elite got it everywhere, and the middle, working middle class and manufactured goods in, the, in the, like India and China did so well. It's because of the movement of knowledge. Now, I think that will be somewhat different this time um, because it's affecting competition for people who have good jobs, white collar jobs. And there's the low end stuff, telemigrating, uh, you know, call center services or data entry. That's affecting relatively low income white collar workers, but still they're above the median. But there's a lot of this stuff like in legal services or medical services or financial services, which are affecting people at the high end. So I believe that digital technology won't continue the inequalization of income inequality in the rich countries, and I think it will, will massively narrow the inequalities between the middle-income countries and the richest countries. Okay, we are running out of time, but just a couple of questions, if there are still in the room, very, very briefly. One, two, three, and then we'll have to stop, I'm sorry. Uh, hi, I'm Beher, I'm here student at MDEV at the Graduate Institute. Uh, my question is about the tele-migration. Uh, the first question is about uh, the contractual agreement specifically on privacy of uh, the data that, is, that a consultant or some pr freelancer is working on. Example of Upwork, uh, uh, what are the privacy clauses or the privacy, um, I don't know, like uh, enforcement on the data that this person is working on? The second one is, did any country in the world has uh, talked about the tax evasion uh, of this issue. Uh, Sergio, over there. Oh, you have a mic. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, Sergio Puig, University of Arizona. Uh, thank you so much for, for this very compelling story. And I think it's just really well uh, told. And I think it's going to be very effective. Just want to um, push back and see how do you respond to the criticism that has emerged from the reviews of your book about that this story seems to suggest that there is this uh, inevitable force, uh, you know, and tends to obscure uh, another story that's also creating anxiety, which is the lack on social investment, uh, the difficulty of, uh, uh, you know, taxing corporations, and you briefly refer to, you know, aspects of uh, regulatory mechanisms for large technology companies. So uh, what is the response to, to that criticism? And the, the last question I had pointed at, yes, uh, there in the back, completely in the back. Um, my name is Sara Lucia Angon. I'm from Los Andes University, Colombia, and currently from the World Trade Institute. So uh, in this globalized economy, uh, labor law standards are, are, are super important. But not only labor law, but standards and certification standards in general. For instance, due diligence standards. So what do you think will be the role of the certification standards as trade buyers? For instance, in the mining sector, all due diligence standards cut off um, artisanal and small scale mining, which is one of the best uh, sectors of Colombian economy. 
So how do you think this, they, these certification standards will interact as trade buyers? Okay, let, let me uh, answer those quickly. Um, I don't know about the privacy clause. So, so we, I run a website called voxeu.org and we hired a copy editor through freelance. And we asked her to sign a, an agreement to not release the columns before they were posted. And who knows what court that could ever be enforced. And it was just to make sure that we understood each other. I don't think. Um, we, we need to talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know what uh, real firms do. But for, for instance, I was in Buenos Aires, I think in November. And they, there was an entire building full of American Express people doing essentially telemigration, but they were actually employed or, or have some contractual relationship with American Express. So I think that's how they deal with it. And another uh, example, which I think is, it also tells you how regulation can be used to protect this, is in Switzerland we have incredibly strict privacy laws in the banking sector. So if client data leaves Switzerland, somebody goes to jail. And as a consequence, the Swiss banks have never offshored their back office stuff like every other bank in the whole world has done because it's just not worth it. So it's done in the remote areas of Switzerland, not, not the remote areas of the world. Tax evasion, I've never heard anybody complain about it, but this stuff really started in 2016, so just wait. And it's really picking up. Uh, so Upwork went public last year, it's worth over a billion dollars. Its revenue is growing at 20% per year. And so it's relatively small now, but I'm quite sure it'll, it'll kick up and it'll probably be labor unions in the rich countries per, uh, bringing up the problem. Uh, the, yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that, that, that um, this technological view of what drives it is I'm, as a social, con social scientist, looking for exogenous changes because everything is so endogenous and I need some one big thing that explains why all over the world countries started signing bilateral investment treaties. You, you go to Eastern Europe and there's a story about the fall of the Berlin Wall. You go to uh, Europe, uh, go to Asia and they talk about the Asian crisis and you go, everybody has a story, but I was trying to put them together. Um, in the, the, but I definitely agree that the problem with globalization is not globalization, it's the lack of domestic regulation to complement it. And I think you can see the reaction to globalization is very different in countries where the governments look after the workers, not the jobs. Uh, and that's the correct way to do it. Um, standards is interesting, so um, I didn't, haven't thought about the big versus small thing, but I think a, a useful way of doing it is to look at how services have been tried to integrate in the European Union. There's decades of experience, it's very difficult, they've tried all sorts of different things with accreditation, uh, all, all sorts of private standards, whatever, and so I think there's a lot of lessons as to how regulation will slow down this telemigration internationally by looking at what happens inside Europe, uh, inside the EU right now. Okay, wonderful. Um, Richard, thank you so much for spending time with us and uh, let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.